and welcome to the Clean Energy Show. This is episode 12, and my name is Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham, and this is still episode 12. Brian, every week I am amazed at the number of episodes that we accumulate. Yeah, it's almost like we do it every week or something. Well, I guess the weeks are accumulating then, and it's it's disturbing. How is your COVID going this week? Yeah, well, I have. Uh, here's my COVID news for the week. So you know, my new hobby now is I I drive my car to another neighborhood and go for a walk because I'm mm-hmm. bored of my own neighborhood. Good hobby. So yesterday I went to your old neighborhood where you used to live there on uh, York Street. Mm-hmm. What's an older neighborhood with uh, wartime houses? Yeah, so. wartime houses, and uh, you know, I've got a whole update on the neighborhood if you want to hear it. But the, I the... do actually. <laughs> was the, what time of day was it, and was there any bodies in the street? <laughs> it was early morning, like eight eight thirty. Uh-huh. No bodies. They, uh, get a cl- they clean things up. Like <laughs> they that. clean the bodies up. Barely, but they do. Uh, but anyway, here's the biggest news: is that there is a drive-up COVID testing facility in that neighborhood. <gasps> You're kidding? Because no, those I'm COVID not. testing facilities are secret. So Are where they? do they put it? In the, in the, yeah, they don't tell the public because they don't want the public driving up. Right. Have well, to get yeah. Screen first and then go in. Of course, I yeah, I came across it by accident, but yeah, once you get close enough, they have these big electronic signs that point you to where to go. <laughs> that doesn't sound like so. That doesn't neighbor. sound very secret, but uh, <laughs> yeah, presumably, I assumed you had to book an appointment. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I didn't just go drive up and get a test or anything, but there was about three of these giant signs and it would flash with a giant arrow and then really? it would say did COVID you testing. Have pictures? You must have uh, pictures. I did. I took one, one picture on my phone. Oh, uh, well, you'll have to send it. Yeah, I will send that. So, um, yeah, That's you turn in. That's an interesting neighborhood to take a walk in. It's, uh, it's actually quite a nice neighborhood because it's mature and yeah. it's quiet. Well, this is, yeah, the rest of the update about uh, your neighborhood is, yeah, it's it's lovely. You're close to lots of parks. You're close to the sort of government house park area. And then yeah, you're close. The kids there all the time. That's a historic yeah, it, uh, building in Regina. And there's lots of. Some people might think something that's 100 years old is not historic, but it's, uh, <laughs> I guess it's what, 150 years old maybe? Yeah. And there's gardens and flowers there and stuff. So that's real nice. Uh-huh. And then uh, further west, you have the creek and the sort of bike path and that park area sort of between, you know, the creek and the RCMP barracks. Right. I hurt myself right there once when I'm in grade nine. No doubt. Yeah. No, I so, did. Uh, I, it was on a bicycle. It was then the first <laughs> time they opened that uh, bicycling path through the park system in Regina. Yeah. And I was excited to do it. And I had a bike in grade nine and it was a warm night and uh, grade nine was just starting. It mm-hmm. was a great yeah, it was grade nine or 10. And I went out there at night and I didn't know that they had these little posts up to prevent ATVs and things from going. <laughs> right, yeah. So it was dark and I just sort of skimmed one, uh-huh. you know, with my pedal once. And I thought, oh, yeah. what was that? That's weird. <laughs> well, the next time one came up was right there in that neighborhood and I hit it and went uh, oh. uh, over onto the pavement and yeah. uh, uh, hurt my shoulder. Mm-hmm. And my head, well, I wasn't wearing a helmet. They didn't invent helmets then. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know anyone with a bicycle helmet then. I don't know if no, the Tour God de France no. wore them or, or what, but generally people back in 1984, three didn't, didn't wear helmets. So yeah, it was a leisurely ride. It was a lovely ride. And that was my introduction to the bike path. And oh, by the way, my bike was uh, totaled. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, the fork was bent and, uh. I, I took it into the, the, lo- the local bike shop. I'm sure I did uh, digress here, but I took it to the yeah. local bike shop and the guy was, was a bit of a hippie and he was a cycling enthusiast. He kept, sh- kept shaking his head and saying, this bike <laughs> has been abused. This bike has been abused. I said, no, I had an accident. No, it's been abused. <laughs> He's like, I don't abuse bikes. I like my bike. Jesus. I had a near accident in that area a few years ago, cause there's the big dirt hill right in that area. Right. Right. So yes, you can yes. either take the leisurely bike path around the hill, or if you want to be a daredevil, you can go over the hill and you bike up and then you can go down it uh, really it's fast. It's a steep little hill. It's probably like 15, 20 feet high or something. Yeah. You can get, uh, you can start going really, uh, surprisingly fast. And I, I nearly wiped out as about a 50 year old man. Oh, you don't want to do that. No, no. Your bones are not, are not flexible and, and spongy like when you were young. They'll just snap like twigs. 
And here's my other near bicycle accident. I guess I've never really had a bad one, but I remember like a long time ago, I was in my 20s. And you know how windy it gets here, right? In your 20s, yes. <laughs> in your 20s, it gets real windy. And I remember biking home one day in the south end of Regina, and there was just an insane tailwind, like about 80 kilometers an hour tailwind. And I not thought, unusual. Hey, we had one two days no, ago. No, not unusual at all. And I thought, hey, it'll be fun to see how fast I can go with this tailwind. And uh, got going, uh, you know, I didn't have a speedometer or anything, but I suspect I was going about 50 kilometers an hour. And, uh, and then I had to make a turn, like I had to turn off oh, and, uh, that's always a problem. and I was like, oh gee, I think I'm going a bit too fast. And then I, you know, I put on the rear brake and then the, the rear wheel locked up and started sliding out in front of me. And through some miracle, I, I managed not to, to fall and die. Oh, it's a miracle, but you're alive. It's a miracle. Yeah. Okay. How many miracles are there in the Brian history that uh, kept you alive? That's it. Just those two. Just those uh, two and they involve mics. But anyway, um, yeah, so the rest of the update on your neighborhood, uh, the house right next to your house, like uh, the one directly- Do you think I haven't been there? You haven't been I there? Spent You've been 10 there. years of my life, my kids were born in that house. <laughs> Not in the so house, you, but you know how it is. So you drive by frequently? Uh, sure. Yeah, so there's a, a year. there's a new house next door, so I guess you knew that. Yeah. So yeah. there was this tiny shack, if you remember, I used to have parties back then. Yeah. Uh, not my 20s, but my 40s. Uh, back before children took over the universe. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this tiny little shack next door on basically a double lot. Mm -hmm. There's there lots of double lots. Mine was somewhat of a double lot. It was 50 feet. It was, you know, because some, some lots there are 25 feet, so it could count as a double lot. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, the tiny shack, and there was a crazy person in there. Like, mm -hmm. he had brain damage. He, I don't know what happened to him, but something. Yeah. I, I don't think he was born that way. I think it was one of those situations because there was damage to his head. He mm -hmm. really got into a car accident when he was 20 or a bicycle accident trying to make a turn. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he, he had this giant freezer outside, uh, deep freeze outside <laughs> yeah. his house with locks on it. Yeah, yeah. And we always wondered who was in there, like, uh, <laughs> and who might go in there. Yeah. No, he was just, he was, uh, he was chatty and, and kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I heard him having sex with his wife once. It was just a uh, very unpleasant, <laughs> uh, I didn't know what was, it was like wild animals. I didn't know what was going on at first. And then, <laughs> so, well, yeah. And then somebody who owned the house had this giant, um, uh, uh, garage. Like it, it looked like it would hold, um, I don't know, like bigger than, bigger than buses. Mm -hmm. it looked like it would hold two buses and even mm -hmm. taller than that. Looked like it would hold a combine or a small jet. And it was the biggest garage I've ever seen. But uh, mm -hmm. the guy just built this giant garage for whatever reason. And he had a, uh, was a plumber who owned the house and he had uh, gases in there. So we used to, you were there, uh, we used to have fires uh, in the backyard, like a fire pit with um, stones, mm -hmm. you know, like a stone fire pit. Well, anyway, I didn't thoroughly put out a fire one night, apparently. And, uh, like two days later had, had eaten through the peat moss under the ground, hmm. started the fence on fire, which my <laughs> neighbors across the alley who were very, uh, they thought they were better than me. They weren't. No one in that neighborhood <laughs> was better than me. You know that. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> you could verify that to this day. Yeah. So they, uh. They were, they left this uppity note in my mailbox that there was uh, very bad gases that the plumber used, like not propane or what, what is it? There's a gas that, uh, that, that plumbers use. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's very explosive. And you know, well, why is it there then? It's in my neighbor's garage. Why, why are you having this? It's not my fault. It was just a freak of nature. So I had but to rebuild the fence. But you started the fence on fire, so it is your fault. Well, it's my, it's not my fault that, that there was ashes that didn't quite, you know, take care of themselves in a stone fire pit. It went <laughs> underground and burnt my fence. The fire went underground. Under, that's what I'm telling you. The grass was fine. <laughs> the grass okay. and there was a flower bed there and you, you could, you could see it. There was evidence. Uh -huh. You could see that uh, near the fence that uh, things started on fire again, unless there was, no, I, I, it, it was a broad, 
spreading of a fire that about a foot and a half wide that went right towards the fence and and wow. in sort of the peat moss layer that I had under my lawn and, and flower bed and uh and that's that's my story, Brian, and I'm sticking to it for now. Wow. Okay. Either way my fence went on fire and it was my fault. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, they've replaced there was a guy across the alley, by the way, who died in a fire in a Oh, no. House. Not right across the alley, but right across the alley and one to the right. Mm -hmm. And um, old person uh, died in about five years ago. And I think they just, I went there recently and they tore down the house. But it's a nice old neighborhood. You know, I live in a 1978, 79 neighborhood now, and it's just not mature. Yeah. And uh, it's not mature as that was. Like there's dense trees and, you know, 50 year old trees. And mine blew over mm -hmm. and made it on the weather network in me. May recall. Oh yeah, I recall that. Yeah. <laughs> now everybody sends pictures to the weather network. You can't get on anymore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, lots of the houses it seems like uh, have been replaced. There's quite a few new ones. But yeah, I was surprised that there was so many. What seems to be like seniors living also in that neighborhood, more towards government house. Is that right? I, yeah, that's what it seemed like. You know, like Pioneer Village is sort of by there and. Yeah. Uh, I sort of thought maybe that's why they put the COVID testing in that area, because there seemed to be lots of seniors. We'll just follow the old people right over and uh, they'll die in the COVID <laughs> testing. Drive yeah, you got to, you know, keep Is them in the Is it a drive-through test? That's what it seemed to be, yeah. I mean, I didn't drive up, so I, I couldn't tell you for sure, but that's and what was, it seemed. Was it in the park there? No, it's like, uh, it was like, seemed to be pointing me towards the parking lot of one of these, uh, apartment buildings. Really? Yeah. In an apartment building? That's what I thought it was, but you know the neighborhood better than me, so. Um, well, after this podcast is over, I'm going to take a trip over there and investigate. That's I think it's a, a great idea. Yeah. I think I went in on 11th and that's where the first sign is that points you. Hmm. Would have been interesting if you witnessed an early morning murder. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, maybe I did and I'm just not, uh, maybe I murdered somebody and I'm just Think not sharing the it. stories you would have for the podcast. It'd be an extra yeah. long edition. But, uh, no, it's just a nice little walk. I'm really, I'm running out of neighborhoods to walk in, like, you know, cause I like to have a different one every day. Well, don't come to a plan. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I will. <laughs> no <laughs> offense. There's, there's nothing here for you, Brian. Just yeah. stay the hell away. We, so, we like uh, our own kind here. <laughs> Uh, and I've been driving around in the car in the Tesla. I have it set up now for one pedal driving. Okay. Uh, it was kind of set up that way. You didn't care for that ori originally, right? So you turned yeah, it off. Yeah, it's, it's disconcerting at first. So we set it so that it creeps a little bit. So it behaves more like an automatic transmission, uh, gas car. So yeah, when you first get it, it's sort of a disconcerting way to drive. So for the last week I've been, I sort of turned it back on. So you really can do many, many trips around town without ever touching the, the gas pedal, the way it's set up now. You're just constantly, uh, you know, putting weight on and off of the, uh, the accelerator. And, uh, yeah, I'm getting used to it. I'm still not sure if I like it. I may end up switching it back, but, um, yeah, it's, it's fun to try. Uh, and I tried out the automatic wipers. So, uh, you know, Tesla has some fancy artificial intelligence that monitors the, the windshields and, uh, cause it was raining the other day when I, when I went to your neighborhood and, mm -hmm. uh, put the wipers on auto and, uh, yeah, they did a, a great job of coming on when they needed to. You didn't tell me it was raining. That, that yes, adds it was... a lot of nuance to the story <laughs> and mood. Yeah. So oh yeah. It was, it was cloudy, rainy, and a little bit chilly. Oh, chilly. Wow. Well, I don't care about the chill. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So I... Uh, in the Nissan Leaf, the old 2013 Nissan Leaf I have, there's an eco mode with aggressive braking. And I sort of use that. Um, it's a lot more aggressive in the newer models, by the way. But people online seem to like that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. it, yes, it takes getting used to, but brakes are for suckers is what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. I, I know that some cars will have will actually engage the brakes and under 10 kilometers, the last, you know, as you get under 10 kilometers an hour and then lock them. No. And the Tesla does that too. Just as you're it coming does. up to a, a stop, it automatically applies the brakes to hold the car. Well, I, I think I would like that. How long have you been doing it? Just for about four or five days. Well, that's long enough to get used to it. Are you used to it? Uh, or can you not teach an old dog new tricks? 
almost used to it. I think the only part I don't like is when I'm backing out of the driveway. It seems difficult to modulate the pedal just right. So I'm always sort of herking and jerking to get out of the driveway. Uh, it's hard to get the right Old man Stockton's drunk again. Yeah, exactly. It looks like I'm drunk. Because normally you get a nice creep when you set it to creep, where mm -hmm. it, you know, easily creep out of your driveway. So uh, we'll see if I get used to that. So automatic transmission vehicles will have a creep in them. So when you take the foot off the brake, it'll yeah. automatically go forward. You know, I had a, an old crappy car once that was uh, something where I was wrong with a carburetor. And you could actually, mm -hmm. if you took the foot off the brake, it would go like city speed of 50 kilometers an hour <laughs> for a yeah. while. Yeah. I actually liked it. That's not, that's, that's kind of an automatic car here in a way. Well, those old 70s cars, I remember, they had a sort of a high idle function. So when it was cold out, you would start right. the car and it would, yeah. And then you would have to sort of tromp on the gas pedal one time, like just push it to the floor quickly. Yeah. And that would, that oh. would put it back to low idle. Brings back memories. Yeah. Of days gone by. Now yeah. it's all computer controlled fuel, fuel injection. And yeah, no, I, I wasn't that long ago that I was getting an oil change with a Prius, my uh, 2012 Prius. And the guy said... Uh, okay, now let it push the gas pedal and run it at uh, <laughs> um, three thousand RPMs for a minute. And I said, yeah. "Okay, well," and nothing was happening because it was an EV mode. Yeah, he, yeah. There was nothing I could do about it, and you uh, couldn't turn it on. Even if it wasn't an EV mode, you, if you push the pedal, nothing happens because you're in park. So it it, right. it 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 increases the idle like just a, a hint. You could barely notice it, and yeah, mm -hmm. I just could not understand that. This goes back to my whole beef against uh, oil change staff. They're just out of jail and I don't like them. <laughs> yeah. And they think they're smarter than you because it's their whole power trip in life is that they know more to the people coming in for their oil change than the people wouldn't be coming in for the oil change. Mm -hmm. so, so you're reliant on their expertise, mm -hmm. even though they killed a guy, obviously, at some point obviously. in life. All right. Uh, so, so I have an update on my, uh, remember my exciting scintillating story about buying an extension cord yes that was scintillating it was you know the most fascinating story probably ever heard on a podcast a very expensive extension cord for your cottage yeah. let me do mm -hmm. the recap here <laughs> <laughs> it was got to plug it to your to where your oven is in the kitchen in the cottage i've never seen your cottage but yeah. uh, you plug it into the cottage kitchen 220 outlet uh and it goes out your back door somehow without letting in mosquitoes. And you plug your Tesla in and charge it at, oh, let's say, I want to say six kilowatts. Yeah, about that. Um, so like 50 kilometers an hour, maybe? Yeah, about that. Okay. And it costs how much? You got a deal so on it. The regular price was $250, but Amazon had one that was a sort of a scratch and dent sale. It had said it had cosmetic issues. It had been maybe a return uh -huh. and it was a uh, $100. It was the deal of the century. Oh, that's a sweet deal. I mean, it really is because there's nothing better than a sweet deal on something you don't want to buy. It's not like this yeah. is a fun thing. No, I it's don't want like to buy a new this. stereo, but if you. If, if, if this, this lousy extension cord, which you have to spend hundreds of dollars on just so you can charge faster at the cottage comes in at a greatly reduced price. Well, that's a win. Yeah. Well, do you want to hear the update? No. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. All right. Yeah. I got an email from Amazon that said, yeah, sorry, we don't have that. We can't send it to you. Fudge. <laughs> yeah. So either they sold it to somebody else or that is they the couldn't... worst update ever. They couldn't find it. They lost it in the warehouse. Oh, Who knows? That's frustrating. But they, uh, they canceled God dang my order. this COVID. And this was after waiting a month because, you oh. know, the ship date was a month out. So that's I, incredibly I, disappointing. I waited the entire month and it was supposed to come on Monday of this week. And then on Monday, that's when I got the email. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We don't have that. The day it was supposed to come. Sorry. It's not coming because. It, we don't have it. It doesn't exist. You're out of luck. That's almost as bad as the time as I ordered a media backdrop for a film festival we were taking your film to, mm -hmm. and I was excited about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I get. <laughs> I designed it in Photoshop and sent away and had the budget from our executive producers to spend some money, 
And uh, it came from somewhere in a big tube, a big cardboard tube, like an uh, eight foot card, no, let's say 12 foot cardboard tube. Mm -hmm. The cardboard, cardboard tube had broken in half on the plane <laughs> and the backdrop made of vinyl came out and is on the plane. So somewhere there's a giant vinyl backdrop <laughs> advertising your film, uh, possibly on a 747 going to Hong Kong. I don't know. But yeah, was, probably just I got an empty fucking tube. <laughs> I was so excited to get this. And it was like cutting it by the hour, you know, and just to get it in time. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was terrible. It's probably stuck to the side of that airplane to this day. <laughs> yeah, maybe it fell out. Maybe it's yeah. over Indonesia or somewhere and uh, I floating in the ocean. <laughs> Somebody's, it'll make the news one night. You'll see it. What is this thing? Yeah. So anyway, so I had to reorder the cable at uh, full price, but uh, the the good news is they did drop the full price slightly. So it only cost me two hundred and thirty dollars from two fifty. From two fifty. So yeah, that was something. I wonder if they did that just just for me. I know. No, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares. Did they say? Did they, did your email say click on this link and buy the other one? Reorder? Nope. No, that has never happened to me. I bought a lot of crap off of Amazon mm -hmm. and, uh, I've never had that problem. Have you, is this the first did, for you? Well, no, I bought a Blu-ray one time from an, you know, an, uh, an authorized reseller, like a third party that, that they allow third parties to sell off Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I bought a Blu-ray and it never showed up and, uh, it turned out to be some kind of a scam, scam operation and, uh, oh. had to get a refund because they had be sent, true. uh, like they sent me a tracking number and everything like they had shipped it and uh -huh. it just didn't come and didn't come. And, and yeah, the whole thing turned out to be a scam. Was that a long time ago? Well, uh, three or four years ago. Really? Modern yep. history. That's in right. modern history. Yep. That surprises me. But I got a refund, so it wasn't the worst. Ah, it's still, it, 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 it erodes your trust in the world. <laughs> Does it not? But I mean, not getting that cable for a hundred dollars. That's uh that that's was a, a nasty. That's a kick in the <sighs> testicles that was that's, bad uh, that's bad that's uh, that's gonna ruin you for a while that's uh i mean if it isn't bad enough that we're in a pandemic quarantine here you get screwed mm -hmm. by the man in a big way so it's terrible I, all right so what uh what have you got to chat about should we start a gofundme <laughs> sure <laughs> bye brian's i feel like we have to do something <laughs> well you know brian i i watched um the film, uh, on clean energy that, uh, Michael Moore, uh, put his name on. In fact, <laughs> watching him on Colbert, you'd think it was his film almost. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, uh, reading media reports, oh, there's a new free Michael Moore film on the environment. This'll be good. Yeah. Uh, Cause I've enjoyed his films and I, yes, I politically agree with him on, uh, on his, uh, where he lives in the political spectrum. And maybe some things have been, uh, um, too much drinking the Kool-Aid over the years, but I've enjoyed his films. They've been entertaining. And, um, this was not entertaining. It was not an entertaining film. It was directed by a collaborator. Who I don't know has made a film before, but he's been sort of collaborating with more and it's called uh, planet of the humans. And it's got 3 million views on YouTube. They dropped it on YouTube because they couldn't find a distributor. And the interesting story why they couldn't find a distributor is because it's actually uh, not in any way accurate. It, it, it's, it's, it's perplexing. You watched some of it too, right? Yeah, I watched about half of it. What did you make of it? What was your impression of it? Well, Because I've had yeah, people contacting me saying, James, what's the story of this? Is it true? Yeah, it, it certainly, yeah, it, it makes you, uh, wonder about a few things, but, uh, of course there's a couple of people smarter than us that have sort of done a kind of a step-by-step -step debunking of it. Yeah. There was, uh, the weird thing I remember was they showed this, uh, solar farm, solar field, and the guy was saying how terribly uh, inefficient the panels are. And I thought, gee, that's kind of weird that I thought panels were a lot more efficient than that. So it was, you know, it was a knock against solar it's it's not efficient enough to be of any use uh but then it turns out that footage was like what 10 or 12 years old yeah they were eight percent efficient panels and mine are 18 and there's ones out there that are pushing 24 i think or 22 um that are you know the, the higher efficiency of the panel the more they cost so you have to sort of balance um 
you know, if you're making a solar farm, you probably buy the cheapest panels because real estate mm -hmm. is cheap and yeah, but they are becoming more and more efficient. So if you bump it up by 1% uh, and you have, uh, you know, uh, acres and acres and acres, hundreds of acres of uh, solar panels, that 1% means you're getting a lot more juice out of there for the buck. So yeah, solar technology is slowly improving. Um, but so watching that, the film, there was no indication of what year that, that footage was no, I shot. Think, like, why are you showing these? This is like a different world you're in. And then he was saying that the solar panels last for only 10 years. Yeah, and that's, which is not accurate either. It's not accurate at all. There's solar panels, even the first ones are still working from the 70s at like 40% of their potential or something, you know, like they're, they're still solar panels from then working and they're, they're warranted. Every solar panel is warranted for 25 years and mm -hmm. expected to put out uh, useful energy for at least 30 years. So it, it, it made no sense. And I, I couldn't understand why he was doing this and where he was getting this information from. And then there was this aghast uh, tone to the whole film that fossil fuels were used to manufacture the solar panels or wind mm -hmm. turbines or anything else. And um, it's, of course, they do. I mean, no, uh, anyone who follows this, like we're doing this podcast because you and I follow this stuff, but you, you constantly see studies um, comparing, say, the, uh, the, uh, green footprint of a, an EV over its lifetime mm -hmm. for manufacturing, including the battery and everything else compared to a fossil fuel car and a fossil fuel cars require, um, things to make them and, uh, gas to burn and melt steel and aluminum. And, um, of course, and we're all hoping one day we get to a point where, uh, even industrial steel melting can be done by green energy, such as hydrogen or, or things yeah. like that or hydrogen made with green energy, which is entirely possible or even right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just, it was showing the most negative sign and, and from the p experts, the scientists who actually study this and, and wrote pieces explaining why this is uh, perplex perplexing and, and bizarre and completely inaccurate is uh, they're, they're like anti-green talking points from not only to not today, but from 10, 12 years ago. The exact points yeah. that they would say, well, you know, solar panels aren't green and electric cars aren't green because they, uh, they burn fossil fuels. I was on the radio on CBC about a m couple of months ago talking about electric cars and, uh, they s told me at the last second that they were bringing on an expert from mm -hmm. the university of Minnesota who was going to have a contrarian view. And even she said, you know, it's still twice as good to have an electric car mm -hmm. in Saskatchewan on our grid, which is half mm -hmm. coal. Um, and the thing is all the grids, including the one there is a lot greener. They were talking about, I think a Michigan grid, which was 95% coal. Even that one is not 95% coal anymore. Coal plants are going away. Yeah. So the, the point of the documentary seems to be that, uh, green technology still uses fossil fuels. Therefore it's bad, but it doesn't go into the, you know, the they, they, they had a got you point for Al Gore because he sold his TV station to Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. uh, which is owned by a fossil fuel state. Well, that's mm -hmm. like saying if I sold my house to somebody who works in the oil sands that I'm mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, my green credentials go down the drain. It makes no sense. It, it, it just, it's, it's completely bewildering. Yeah. Well, every time I get into a green technology, so I have solar panels and I have an electric car, I do try and do the research to see like, what is the carbon footprint of that? You know, what I've put on my roof. And so for the solar panels on my roof, as near as I could tell, there's sort of a carbon footprint of about six months or a year. You only have to use it for longer than that to start seeing the, the green benefits. The cars are maybe a little bit more, uh, but the car I bought, it is the most efficient electric car that you can buy. So I, I would say that it probably has the smallest carbon footprint. So the carbon footprint for a, a, the, the car that I own, is probably a year or two, something like that. There's a year or two worth of fossil fuel use, like similar to if I drove a gas car for two years, something like that. So yeah, these things do have a carbon footprint, but that improves every year. And I don't know, the, the documentary seems to suggest, eh, why even bother? Why bother yeah. trying? Since, since you're supporting fossil fuels by buying a car that was manufactured because the steel was melted with fossil fuels, why not just throw in the towel? It's very nihilistic, the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, I don't understand why. I, I just, I'm perplexed by it. I'm, I'm completely 
off Michael Moore, like his brand is completely ruined to me. Like if, if, mm-hmm. if he can endorse this film, um, like why? Because, yeah. uh, you know, everyone who, who wants to believe bad things is, is believing even worse things than they were being fed now, because this is, uh, this is 12, 12 year old, uh, um, crap, which doesn't even apply to now. And it, all the work that has to be done to, to debunk this and on a one person by person basis is just going to be exhausting. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, damaging and, uh, we should probably, uh, stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should. One of his, his, his points. I mean, generally, yes. Um, I think the, the grander theme from the film is that, um, wind and solar, for example, are not going to cure our climate crisis on their own. We're going to have to make That's other right. sacrifices and make other strong decisions. That part is true, but those mm-hmm. things are part of the mix. And there's, I have no problem with who owns solar panels. If they're going to take over the world, I don't care if the devil does it, you know, like the hell with it. It's okay. Yeah. And we kind of need all hands on deck for this. You know, it, it, um, it's uh, it's going to take many, many things to, to turn this ship around. Oh, another thing, Brian, was that uh, one of his solutions, and the thing is he didn't offer any solutions, but one of the things he was going on about was uh, um, population control, which is uh, yeah. considered to be very kind of r- racist uh, uh, way of looking at the world's problems. Um, yeah. The thing is, is that the 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 places that with the biggest expanding populations have the lowest uh, uh, carbon emissions? You know, people yeah. who um, are uneducated and are living in countries where um, the kids just pile up. Um, those are the places where they're not actually burning any carbon. They're they're mm-hmm. living in in destitute places. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. This is a depressing film and we'll, we'll stop talking about it. But people have actually asked us on the Twitter to, to discuss it. So here we are, we're discussing. Yeah. It. And just to wrap it up, I think that you posted links to a couple of the articles that uh, go into more depth. So I would say, uh, head to our Twitter or James's Twitter, uh, to look at some of these articles. Uh, CLN energy show on Twitter and, uh, I'm Jay Whittingham on Twitter for the heck of it. Well, I try to post things on the, uh, the clean energy show account. Um, there's one thing I forgot to mention last week is that one of our Twitter followers, uh, tweeted us about, uh, how solar power is increasing in Germany during the pandemic because there's no smog. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is not ironic <laughs> that, yeah, that that's the, fantastic to the hear things that, uh, that are killing the world actually help you further improve it by, uh, not being there. I was re- reminded by, um, forest fire smoke we have, we don't live near a forest, but we get the smoke here in the upper atmosphere. So it becomes a dark haze sometimes. And, mm-hmm. uh, there was some fires a couple of years ago or three years ago that were clearly not normal. Uh, mm-hmm. and basically Alberta and BC were burning like crazy. And it was quite obvious that this is not normal and climate change related. And the irony there was that if you can call it irony, or I don't know, if that's the correct use of the word, but my solar was going down. So mm-hmm. climate change was making my solar go down. And I was trying to help the environment and, and this was actually cutting it by 25% or 20% or something. So I know mm-hmm. it's one of those weird things. And again, I'll reiterate this week that I'm hopeful that when we come out of this pandemic, that people are going to, to demand clean air. Yeah. I, I don't have a problem with clean air in Regina so much, but, uh, there are places in the world that are, are really beautiful now that weren't beautiful in a long time. And I hope those people, uh, exert political pressure, uh, because it is possible. It is possible to have, uh, electrified transportation and, and, and more uh, energy in the mix, less, uh, less coal and fossil fuels. Well, I do have a news story here from Electric Autonomy Canada website, and they are reporting that uh, Canadian EV sales uh, increased in quarter one in Canada, despite the disruptions that we've had, uh, a, an increase over quarter four, and quarter one is usually a weak quarter for cars. So it is, yeah. Um, we are, uh, it was up to 3.8% of total light vehicle sales in Canada in the first quarter of this year are electric or, you know, plug-in hybrid battery, uh, battery electric. 
Yeah, it is encouraging. And uh, you know what? I think it's, it, this might tell us something. It might tell us that people are waiting for their next car to be electric. And if you're, yeah. if you're wondering about the economy and you're putting off buying a, a vehicle, then maybe it's time to say, yeah, you know, that happened in China too. There was a, before this year, before all this happened, there was a downturn in auto sales in China because of mm -hmm. the economy, because of tariffs and the, you know, the trade war with the States and so forth. Yet electric car sales were still going up without incentives were without very many incentives. And, uh, so yeah, you, you would see numbers of the, uh, um, oh, normal car sales down 25%, but electric car sales up six, 7% in China in 20. Yeah. And of course we're at this inflection point. So it sounds like sale of traditional gas and diesel cars peaked probably in 2019. So that's on the way down, but of course, uh, EV sales are on the way up and I, yeah, I don't think there's any stopping that that trend's going to continue regardless of what's, what's happening in the world. It is not a good time to be an automaker. Um, if you're not Tesla. Yeah. Tesla seems to have their thing together. Yeah. People are buying less cars. They're lasting longer and people, I think one in 10 people in the States were not returning into their car and not getting another one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's largely due to the, um, gig economy with people using Uber. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, younger people have no desire to own a car these days, mm -hmm. especially in bigger cities because, Hey, use your app, you get around, things happen. No. And we talked before on the podcast about Tony Siba, who is a, uh, you know, economic prognosticator, uh, who, who deals with these kinds of, uh, disruptions. And he posted a, an updated version of his talk on earth day. And of he course did. the thing that he's. Yeah, it's basically the same as what he's done before, but uh, just look for Tony Siba on YouTube if you're interested. It's his typical hour-long talk, uh, but it includes some stuff about the COVID disruption that's going on right now, of course, as as uh, oil prices went negative. Um, but basically, yeah, what he's saying is what happened right now with the pandemic is basically a preview of what oil demand will be in about 10 years. He's got a graph on there. Current demand is about 100 million barrels a day, but during the pandemic, it sort of suddenly dropped to about 70 million, and that's what he's pegged as the figure for 2030. So it should be a steady decline from now at 100 million barrels down to 70 million barrels in, in 10 years. So I don't know if that's enough to, to turn around the climate catastrophe, but... It's, it's ridiculous because you can't tell people where we live that that's ever going to happen. They'll just laugh at you. <laughs> yeah. But if you look at government policy around the world, there's the elimination of uh, fossil fuel cars in, in the center of the city and uh, in various large cities, and that's going to discourage people. That includes delivery vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. As soon as that inflection point of price meets the right sort of place on the graph and it becomes... When you're, when you're operating fleets of vehicles and it becomes cheaper to operate fleets of electric vehicles, be them buses or, um, taxis or, um, government vehicles, vans, trucks, all this, this is going to just take a dive somewhere in the mid twenties, I think. Yeah. And he's, uh, said before that, you know, it's, it's only going to take a slight disruption for the price to drop and stay low. So according to his figures, like the Alberta oil sands will be not viable by around 20, 2021, possibly 2022. Well, they're that, already that's now, not viable man, now. They're but, talking about oil prices staying low. It's going to take years to rebound is what I'm hearing. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, and it's not really going to rebound. So yeah, if he's right, the d demand will be basically 30% less 10 years from now. And I'm, I, I wish it was more than that. I'm not sure if that's enough to kind of reverse uh, climate, but it, it's certainly going to throw the the whole oil industry into a uh, downward spiral. That's for sure. Thirty percent is huge, though, as we can see. If you've got negative oil prices, thirty percent is, and it's not like there's no demand for oil. It's just down thirty percent. Look what's happening. It it makes it completely, literally worthless. And you know, over the next ten years, they will adjust and they'll they'll drop their production numbers and so on and so forth. But and try you know, get the clearly. Up, yeah given the, the difficulty that they're having 
with this brief one month uh, downturn, it, it, it's going to be a rough ride for them. So this, this in many ways, the pandemic, I think the lesson to learn here is that the pandemic is a preview of what's to come. Clean air, low oil prices, a drop in demand, and it wouldn't even take 30% to kill oil. I mean, it would take... Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're talking about, uh, just slowing the growth of oil will, will kill oil because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, once you get, uh, yeah, cause they, the, they're, they're, they're banking on the future and I mm -hmm. don't see how anyone can put a dollar into oil sands if you're not stupid. This yeah. brings me to my next problem though, Brian, and that is the anxiety I feel about what are the bailouts going to be for the oil yeah. industry? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I prefer not to think about it. It's it's kind of <laughs> weird they they need a bailout after only one month. I mean, they've been just printing money for a hundred years, and suddenly they have one bad month and they need a bailout. That seems kind of weird. Yeah, it's yeah, but nobody's going to see it that way, and certainly the the pressure on the federal government in Canada is not going to be that way. Donnie down south has promised that the beautiful oil will be bailed out, and uh, uh, yeah, this is so such a waste of money. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I was going to just quickly mention about Tony Siba is the, the other thing that he's, uh, always predicting is basically the end of individual car ownerships. Uh, so once cars become autonomous, um, there's going to be very little reason to own one because it'll be like Uber, but just way, way cheaper. And so that it's the other problem facing the auto industry is that overall sales are going to be slowly heading down over the next, uh, 10 or 20 years as uh, people stop owning cars and just using them as a service. And the, the thinking, and I'll remind people about that. And, and if you're listening to the show, you're interested enough that you should listen to one of the Tony Siba presentations, and maybe I'll post a link to that. Um, uh, because it is, he's been doing this since about 2012 and he's, his predictions, his projections have been, they call them crazy throughout, but he's always been dead on. Um, you know, the percent of, uh, electric vehicles, like back in 2012, OPEC and the, um, energy commissions of various ones around the world would say, well, we expect 1% of EVs to be, uh, uh, 1% of sales to be EVs by 2040 or 2050, even in some cases, mm -hmm. and it was no, it's going to be 3% by 2019. And it was, it is mm -hmm. in yeah. many places. So. Uh, yeah. And, and it's all about, uh, falling prices and it's all about electric vehicles being better than, than, uh, than gas vehicles that, uh, the preference for the product. And then of course the big thing is like you said, is the, uh, autonomous vehicles because what's going to happen is when vehicles become self-driving, say Tesla is looking at having its own fleet of self-driving vehicles. In fact, it's, it's saying that somebody like you who buys a Tesla can take it to work in the morning and then have it drive around as a taxi all day <laughs> by itself. Yeah. I don't think I'll do that, but it, it can be done apparently. Yes. And that's, we're not far off from that. It, it's, it's the million dollar question as to when are they going to solve, um, full self-driving and uh, not even level five self-driving, but self-driving within a city, within a geographical area, because that's all you need for, uh, you don't need level five where you can go through a desert and find your way through a mountain mm -hmm. pass by yourself. You need to just stay within say New York city, within, um, the boundaries of mm -hmm. New York city and be able to using GPS and, uh, data that your cars has collected. And the, the cost per mile is between 10 and 18 cents per mile which is incredibly cheap because the, the idea is that if you have a fleet of vehicles that are self-driving, they're going to be electric. Why? Because it costs so little. You can set up your own solar panels. If you want on a farm, you can feed the grid mm -hmm. and, and offset it. And, uh, uh, just the electric vehicles, the cost per mile, the maintenance, the fact that they last currently, I think 2.5 times as long as, uh, as a, uh, combustion vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the uh, batteries for Tesla, which should have been announced by now, got, but it got delayed. They have a big battery announcement where they're talking about a million mile battery. So that will change things even greater. Yeah. That battery announcement is going to change the world and we haven't had it yet because of the damn. Yeah. Pandemic. I think sounds like that's coming in May now. Okay. I'd like to move on to uh, another topic. Uh, it's a new segment that I call Brian's TV corner. All right. I'm excited. Is there theme music? <laughs> Did you hire a band? No, there's I no theme not. music. Ryan's TV corner. There you go. There's a theme song. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you remember the show, this old house? 
Vaguely, yes. Uh, yeah. Sure, it's still on, isn't it? It's still on. It's a PBS show that started in 1979. It's all about renovating old houses. And uh, anyway, they, videos from this old house started popping up in my YouTube feed. And their 40th season is them uh, renovating an old house and turning it into a net zero house. Really? The whole season? The whole season. So, yeah, I haven't watched the show in quite a long time. So it's 13 episodes. The first two or three are on YouTube. I think they're going to slowly add more to YouTube. But if you can't wait, like I couldn't wait, I went to the website or you can download. They have an app as well. And all the episodes are, are viewable on this app. So um, it's sort of a mixed bag. I mean, I definitely I think you'd be interested. I, I think you should watch it. Um, there's always boring sections that I, you know, end up skipping over where they're just, they seem to be measuring things for about five minutes, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're taking this old house. <laughs> that's poor built for in the some night. people though, measuring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's good TV. But they took this old house in New England built in the 1920s. It's about a thousand square foot house. They, uh, doubled the size of it. They put a big addition on and a basement and then renovated the whole thing and insulated it in order to try and make it a net zero house. So all the heating, cooling, all the electrical needs. Uh, the one caveat I'll say is I, I don't think there's any possible way it is actually net zero. Mm -hmm. uh, because the system they put, so they built a garage to put the panels on and These it's are only all a in five. New England, right? In New England, yeah, which is warmer than here, but they still have, you know, fairly cold winters with snow and stuff. Um, but yeah, the system they put in was only 5.6 kilowatts and they're using it to heat the house, cool the house and heat the hot water as well as all the lights and everything. So, uh, and they kept calling it a net zero house. I'd be absolutely shocked if it, it turned out to be net zero mm -hmm. and you know, the season ends with them just finishing the project and they, they're just saying, okay, well, we'll give you an update on the, on the net zero. So, but I'm calling it right now. There's, it, it's still very interesting and fun to watch, but there's, there's no way it's actually net zero. You know, one of the guys on that show, you, you watching it over the years, you think, well, they're kind of redneck transmen, but there's one of the guys on the show who's <laughs> always bringing up energy efficient things. And the, oh, yeah. the other guys, it's part of the shtick, but they roll their eyes, you know, here's so-and-so <laughs> again with his energy efficient, his hippie stuff. And that's where I saw the first, um, heat exchanger dryer that you were talking about. Oh yeah. Right. He did a, a, a bit on that. So that was interesting. I know they're very expensive. Uh, um, yeah. but, uh, energy efficient, a lot more, the, you know, more efficient than natural gas or electricity. So that's all very interesting. He kept bringing up other stuff like in floor heating and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So it was interesting. So yeah, they just, they just, they, you know, did fairly heavy insulation. Um, and then the whole thing is heated and cooled by the same machine, this air source heat pump that will heat the home in the winter and cool it in the summer. And also somehow heated the water as well. I didn't quite understand, uh, that part, but yeah, this is stuff that I'm, I'm really interested in. It also didn't seem like they maybe put in enough insulation. Like it's, it's a very high R value, but it didn't seem maybe high enough to get them to net zero. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because... Uh, one of the things that is not front and center right now, but is on the list of things to do to achieve 2050 targets is to improve the energy we use in our home because home heating in Canada mm -hmm. is one of our higher sort of uses of emissions. Yeah. Um, interestingly though, if the oil industry went out of business. Yeah. I was looking at uh, a map, a satellite map of uh, North America and, and uh, they were comparing the di carbon dioxide emissions specifically and uh, of North America in April this year compared to April last year and showing how mm -hmm. they went down. But I, I noticed that Saskatchewan had this big cloud over it between <laughs> Regina and the U.S. border of carbon mm -hmm. dioxide emissions that only went down slightly. And in North Dakota, there was this huge cloud that mm -hmm. uh, has reduced, and that is... That's all methane and stuff coming out of the, um, uh, the various oil operations down there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Pulling the oil out of the ground can, can create a lot of methane. And it's, it's terrible in North Dakota. I think they have less regular, they must have less regulations. I know there's a lot more oil down there than there is on this side of the border, but there it's ridiculous. It's like, yeah, if that all came yeah. to an end, boy, we'd be uh, in better shape. 
And presumably the cloud for Saskatchewan is probably the coal power generation that we have, I assume. Well, it did. It was a large area, so I'm not sure. Like, and it went from yeah. Regina, like I said, Regina to the border, pretty much. And uh, it was consistent year after year. It was slightly less this hmm. year, so I don't know um, yeah. where that's all coming from. But yeah, it's, we do we do have a coal plant down there. That's just mm -hmm. it's it's all very different. I'm, but I'm kind of fascinated that we have a new segment for the show. What's it called again? Uh, Brian's TV Corner. Brian's TV Corner. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it's funny how the show evolves, you know, right, right yeah. beneath my feet. It's just, uh, what next? I don't know. Somebody, if there's anybody out there who'd like to do a theme song for Brian's TV Corner, do you see future segments coming? Uh, sure, absolutely. Is it a one-time thing or is there, this has got potential? Uh, well, I'll keep watching television and, and let you know <laughs> if anything else comes up. But I've always, you know, I just always liked this old house and it was really fun to get back yeah watch it's like old-fashioned television and i kind of enjoy old-fashioned television yeah it's a, and it's about a subject that i'm interested in right and you know we've all been younger and trying to renovate our houses and improve things and it was i've learned a lot from that show actually and and uh oh absolutely it's, it's kind of dorky because they take some hapless uh person who wrote them and uh go to their house and uh <laughs> and uh well this is how you weld a a, a seam on a metal pipe and uh Okay, mm -hmm. I'll try it. <laughs> yeah, in this particular case, this season, it's an architect uh, who bought the house and designed uh, the renovation. So the the homeowner is a is already an architect. So he was obviously very involved in in all of these uh, aspects of it. I'm dying to have an architect design a house that is interesting. Wouldn't that be great? No, I know. Yeah, but I want it to be solar friendly. So I want the roof to have a slope that is the ideal or close to the ideal slope for solar and have it to yep. be massive and yet still be an interesting house. And I kept looking for plans and things like that and they don't exist. I mean, they're hard to find. Um, yeah. People don't actually design houses for solar panels, but I think you could. Yeah, no, I have a dream. We, we have this family cottage property and I have a dream of, of putting up a net zero house there someday. And uh, yeah, that would absolutely be part of it. Have a, a, a roof that's properly positioned for solar super insulated it would be not that difficult i think to to get to net zero for everything what direction does the house back of the house face it faces mostly south mostly south so it's, you're... it's sort of like south uh southeast slightly so you're set then you you it would be a good property oh, absolutely. to develop on yeah and would you retire there uh no, no? <laughs> i just i just want to i don't actually want to live there i just want to build it oh okay <laughs> Well, guy's got to have, you know, ambitions and yeah. we could have a new, uh, a new segment for the show. Brian builds a house, a cottage. So oh, that'd be amazing. Well, I think I pitched to you one time. I had an idea. Weren't we going to do a TV show called something like, uh, you know, the producer fixes up his house or something. There's all these home renovation shows. Well, there it's was like, a comedian well, just... who fixed up a, sh a house in rural Saskatchewan, bought a house. Oh yeah. And then renovated. And I think it was a, a woman who bought a crappy house in a crappy town for next to nothing because you're a comedian yeah. in Canada, you have next to no money. And mm -hmm. uh, she fixed it up and made a TV show out of it uh, to pay that for That sounds it. fantastic. That sounds like the exact idea I had. Yeah. Well, it was. So you didn't act. You could have acted. We could have, we could have done a cottage or something. Solar cottage. All right. I think uh, that probably does it for this week, James. And what a week it's been, Brian. We have a brand new segment for the show, possibly with a theme song. I call upon our listeners to create a theme song for Brian's TV Corner. Even if you're just singing yeah. or harmonizing, I think it's uh, mm -hmm. it's quite exciting. So uh, the show is really expanding. We'll see you again next week. I just want to remind people that our email address is cleanenergyshow at gmail. And we always love to hear from our many many listeners so you can actually record a little uh, audio clip on your computer at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show and catch us on twitter as well cln energy show see you next week brian yeah see you next week